Anyhow, tonight I just want to introduce this nice man. He's been wanting to come here for many, many months. <laughs> many, 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 many months. But I just could never fit him in. And now we're going to have Dave Aiken tell us about the Little Sawmill Run Railroad, its life and legacy. Okay, my name is Dave Aiken. Uh, I worked on the railroad. I started out clerking. I was a yard master for a long time at Scully. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was even the agent at Oakdale for two days, but that's another story. <laughs> and, but the real thing that would interest you folks, maybe, uh, when you first got the caboose in there, I happened to be the demurrage clerk, and I was driving by, and I see, what's this caboose doing by the station? So I promptly went to work that night, midnight, and I put the caboose on the demurrage report that was going to go to Pittsburgh and then to Philadelphia. And when the train master walked in in the morning and the agent walked in and they all about had a heart attack because this was done on the QT. Even the management in Pittsburgh didn't know about it. It was the assistant superintendent, Max Solomon, the train master, and everything was done on the QT. Nobody was supposed to know about this. And I almost ruined the fact that the guy guys got the free caboose from the B&O, so it was a close call. But anyway, so is any, everybody here familiar with the Banksville area? You're all familiar with South Hills, this area here? Okay, well this is, uh, I sort of aimed this at, at you folks out here, it's more this area specific. You want to remember Colonel Espy, he was the, uh, you could say the father of Little Sawmill Run, you know, Espy Avenue in Dormont was named after him. Jacob Henrici was the uh, junior, then the senior trustee at the Harmony Society down at Old Economy. Uh, Hartley and Marshall, they ended up operating the uh, large mine in Banksville where uh, Staples is located down there now. And uh, you'll find it. They uh, influenced this area as well, especially the Harmony Society. I do a lot of volunteering down there, and a lot of people don't realize the, the impact that the Harmony Society had on this area. Even uh, buildings and houses that were built with uh, brick from the Harmony Society or lumber that was milled and that sort of thing. So, not to get off the subject, but here's a little sawmill run railroad. Okay. So here is the uh, Sawmill Run watershed out along 51 there that you're familiar with. I have a lot of extra maps in here because at one time I gave the uh, program and people weren't sure where the area was. Now here's the mouth of the Sawmill Run. You've probably seen this uh, painting, Salt Works. And here's uh, the Washington Pike. And the Washington Pike turned up this away on Independence and a this would be the Steubenville Pike over here. So that's the West End Circle today. Yeah, that's where the bridge is, yeah. That's... Any questions, uh, be sure to ask them. So before the little sawmill run railroad, we had the St. Clair Railroad. That was a horse-drawn wooden railroad, wooden rail railroad built by Alexander Kirk Lewis for John Snowden, who had been the third mayor of the city of Pittsburgh, and that's the guy that they named Snowden, with now South Park Township after. Okay, now a lot of the history, uh, they have that sort of backwards, but Alexander Kirk Lewis, he built maybe the first, I don't like to say anybody did anything the first because somebody will argue with you, but he built a lot of the inclined planes to get, get coal from Mount Washington down to the valley. John Snowden was in the, uh, the coal business. Snowden's wife's maiden name was Elliot, and naturally their family estate is now the neighborhood of Elliot, so the coal mine under Elliott was probably hauled by the St. Clair Railroad. And then we also had the Temperanceville and Nobles Town Plank Road. That was owned in part by the Harmony Society. So that was originally what is now Main Street in the West End, Nobles Town Road. And there was a two mile extension toward uh, the Washington Pike. So Washington Avenue through Carnegie, that was part of the Nobles Town Plank Road. That was the extension that would hook up with uh, the Washington Pike at Woodville. And the prototype for the little sawmill run was the Chartier's Coal Railroad. So 
here we have a map I cropped. Here's the Chartier's Coal Railroad, ran from uh, the rocks, there's Thornburg Bridge here, and it went, or here's Thornburg Bridge, and it went under, uh, the coal mine was under the uh, country club up there in uh, Thornburg. Okay, and they had an inclined plane, and it was funded by investors from New York. They operated about uh, four years, they had a lot of labor trouble. And then down below here, we have the uh, St. Clair Railroad, and it ran up to about under Shady Crest. And then here's your Steubenville Pike. So, in this photograph taken in 1908, looking up Banksville Road today, we can see the right of way of the St. Clair Railroad where it went up the hill. And of course, when you come down the parkway on the inside of Green Tree Hill, the inbound side, if you look over there, you can see some slate dumps. So again, we have the same old map, only this time in Keller, and we have the St. Clair Railroad, Chartier's Creek, naturally very important, Tom's Run, George's Run, Painter's Run, and the Panhandle Trench, very important. The Panhandle Trench, the coal is around 12 foot deep at the maximum. So people wanted to uh, get to the Panhandle Trench, and it ran out Painter's Run and up Tom's Run. So the Little Sawmill Run Railroad was chartered in 1850. They got permission to construct the thing in March uh, 5, 52, but why wait for that? They started on March 3rd. They made the first run on April 11, 53. It was merged into the West Side Belt, the Harmony Society being the primary stockholder, they sold uh, their interest to various bankers. The Little Sawmill Run was dissolved on July 3rd of that year, and the West Side Belt was pur purchased, yeah, purchased by the Wabash Pittsburgh Terminal in 1904, and Gould had plans of using the line to Banksville to reach his coal fields in Washington County, so they had the branch to Banksville rebuilt in 07, then the Wabash went bankrupt in 08. So from 53 to uh, 74, okay, it was chartered to build a, a single double track railroad from the mouth of the sawmill run to George's run on Chartier's Creek, but they stopped the construction short at the Espy Estate, which again is where Staples is on Banksville Road now. And that was the location of the railroad's enterprise mine. The railroad owned the mine. And they had one of the first company houses in the Pittsburgh Press in 56. They claim it was the first, but again, I hate to say anything was the first. And then permission was granted to extend a little sawmill run to Painter's Run right over here in 74. And you'll see how that's going to work out with this area. Here's a map of 1856. This is the uh, West End. You can't read this, but that's uh, Baker and Henrici. They were the trustees of the Harmony Society. Here's a little sawmill run railroad on this property, but of course, in all practicality, the property owned by the Harmony Society, it was all the same thing. You notice there's no Pennsylvania Railroad, no P&LE, and the, this would have been the bridge across Steuben Street that they just, well, the replacement bridge they just took on. Okay, now to save money, most railroads use cut and fills and retaining walls. You know, they grade the hill, fill in the valley. Well, they didn't do that. The Little Sawmill Run didn't do that to save money. This would have been Independence running on the, uh, the Greenleaf side of uh, the valley in the West End, and that's the type of trussle that they erected. And there's the uh, Sawmill Run. This is Woodville Avenue, and this is what they built here instead of having a fill in a retaining wall. And this is another thing further up the valley. You'll see this picture further on. And now, right now, I'm going to show you a photograph that was taken about 1912 where this uh, structure was. So I really like this photograph. You know, that's a nice picture. But uh, this is where that structure was right there. The photographer standing on the Shaler Street Bridge and, of course, your uh, Wabash Bridge. And by this time, it's the West Side Belt going out to Clareton there. Are they the bridges the parkway goes under today? Well, this is, but it's been reworked. It was remodified in 1934 to handle more equipment. This bridge was removed and replaced, and we'll see how that's going to work later on. It's pretty neat stuff. Okay, so they needed some locomotives. So they went to Baldwin, 
And for about $7,200, they bought this engine. It was named the uh, Economy. The uh, George Gray was the engineer. He won to name it after Colonel Espy. Espy said he didn't want the honor. He named it after the, the Economy because that was a, related to the Harmony Society. So then a couple years later, business is booming. They go back. Uh, Gray goes to Philadelphia to Baldwin. He wants another engine like this. They say, you don't want that model. You want this 060 because all the weights on the drivers, you'll be able to haul more freight. So they named it to William Penn. And it, it was a, a lot better than the, uh, the economy. So after the Civil War, they wanted to go get another engine like the William Penn, which again, it cost them around $7,000. However, wartime inflation increased the price to about uh, $23,000, too much money. So Little Sawmill Run bought a second-hand version of this uh, Type C number one, and they named it the Harmony after the Harmony Society. Now, to make things complicated for historians, Another railroad that was uh, owned in part by the Harmony Society was the Darlington Cannel Coal Railroad. They named one of their engines Economy, just to confuse things. And their engine was a brand new engine, but this is the same type as the William Penn. And that's what the William Penn would have looked like, but this is the engine that belonged to the Darlington Cannel Coal. Now this is what about their train would have looked like. And the way it was set up with the handrails. And you'll notice this, of course, is off a stock certificate, but this is a uh, office car special. You know, the p and V used to run those office car specials with Graham and the NS. They get out, <coughs> excuse me, get out the business cars. Well, here we have some bunting on the cars and we have some officials in there. The Chartier's Railroad did the same thing and they lined their cars with calico and put benches in them and then they hauled the officials around in them. So the office car special has been around a long time. Now, what kind of equipment did we use to haul coal? This photo was taken in 1904, yet this equipment was the equipment that was used 54, 50 so, some years earlier. So really they were using pretty antiquated technology. These cars held around five ton of coal, four wheel cars with drop bottoms. But that's what they were hauling coal in. And you see, this is a little bit different construction than the rest of the cars. So this is the technology they used for over 50 years. And this is a map of the uh, little sawmill run coal mine. And here's Staples down here in the drugstore. And in 1861, in October, they had, they had three, uh, 240 acres. They had mined out 70 acres. And they had trouble keeping the mine dry. They had trouble with the cable snapping. And George Gray, who at the time went west to work in some mines in Indiana, corresponded with Henrici, who by this time was the uh, senior trustee at the Harmony Society, he was a secretary. And uh, George Gray, I don't mention this in the book because it's speculative, he said that the fellow running the pumps and running the cable haulage he was snapping the cable to break the cable so he could make overtime, and he was causing, he was sabotaging the pumps so he could stay over, make overtime, and repair them because he wanted to go back to England. So, here we go from 75 to 95, and here we have now the railroad scene has increased. Now, here's your little sawmill run, here's Bridgeville down here with the branch, the CV Valley, and the main line of the Panhandle. Here's your uh, Pittsburgh and Connellsville. Everything else is Pennsylvania Railroad. But even though the, the little sawmill run did not connect with any railroads, it just hauled coal to the river. Now, this is out of the Atlas City, Upper Ohio Valley from about 1876, 1878. So again, here's Staples in here. Here's Espy's estate, built in 18 or I'm sorry, 1797, it burned down in 1926 or so when vagrants were living in there. And we ventilated the mine with a furnace before we had fans. You had the rope haulage hauling the coal to the tipple. And this is sort of idealized, this photograph, because there's a fella dumping slate right in front of the engine house, which no doubt didn't happen. And they have the engine headed wrong. They always kept their engines headed 
uphill toward Banksville. Here's your company houses, and we see old Banksville Avenue, ducks in the creek, some more company houses. This engine house was built in 1876. It wasn't torn down until 1934, right before they built the road. And here's a little sawmill runs passenger car, which was a combine, so it had a little bit of a freight compartment so they could haul packages or maybe milk and eggs and so forth. And it coasted downhill to the west end, and they hauled it back up with the uh, empty coal cars. The only time they had trouble coasting downhill was if there was a lot of snow on the track, then the thing would stall. But outside of that, uh, that's how they operated their passenger service. Okay. So where did this coal all go to? It went down here, and here's uh, from the same atlas, and of course now we have the Panhandle up there. It was originally built as a Pittsburgh Steubenville, went to the Panhandle, Pittsburgh, Cincinnati, and St. Louis, Pittsburgh, Cincinnati, Chicago, and St. Louis, 99 or 999 year lease by the Pensy, and of course we still call it the Panhandle. Here's a little sawmill run train with the engine headed wrong, and your coal tipples. They lowered the coal cars to the barges because if they, when they had chutes and they were letting the coal drop right into the cars, there was a lot of breakage, and you want the lumps of coal as big as possible. That way, there's more air space between the lumps of coal. And you know, if you've got fine coal, you're selling a lot of tonnage, and you're not getting the uh, the measure. And here's John A. Woods had the uh, coal dock here, and you'll still see barges tied up here on the river. He had a uh, he lived in LA, or he lived in Esplanade where he lived. And now here's what we did to service other parts of the city. This is the uh, what would be the 12th Street Bridge today, or the David McCullough Bridge is there. This is Chestnut Street on the north side. So they barged the coal over here, and they unloaded it, and then they would deliver it on the north side or other places in the city of Pittsburgh. Now, they also sold coal to the Clinton Iron Works, this photo printed backwards, and it was after the P&LE was built, but the Clinton Iron Works was the first iron works to successfully use coke to make iron. So they bought their coke originally from the little sawmill run who had coke ovens, but they weren't really successful until they started using coke from the Connellsville coke region because the coal from this area is good for steam, making gas, and for heating and blacksmithing, but it's not good for coking. So here's Banksville, and here's Chapel Avenue, and uh, Mount Lebanon office supplies right here. This is the venture mine goes in under Green Tree. Now, if you look here, if you could read this, it was kind of hard to read. You'll see there's a lot of beadlings down in Banksville. Beadling, 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 beadling. So the beadlings from beadling started out being the beadlings from Banksville. Okay? So that's one of your first ties to the area. So now here's... Uh, Here's West Pittsburgh, Union Township. And in West Pittsburgh, you had the Singer Nimick Mill, Jacob Painter and Sons, Reitman Glass. That Clinton Ironworks is up here. Now the little sawmill run came down, went here to their coal docks. Now right here, Gray and Bell ended up owning uh, four mines. And they purchased the chess mine that was up on Chicken Hill. And they had an inclined plane, they had coke ovens and they had a narrow gauge railroad hauled the coal around to Singer Nimick and Jacob Painter. Well, Jacob Painter, he financed the tunnel, the first tunnel under Mount Washington to get the coal to his mill faster and more dependably. So now we, this right away was redundant, it wasn't needed. And uh, Chicken Hill, I don't know if you know, but Green Tree, uh, the farmers in Green Tree had trouble with the folks that lived on Chicken Hill stealing chickens. So twice before 1920, they deputized people and they went over and straightened out the chicken thieves on Chicken Hill. But that's why Chicken Hill was called Chicken Hill. And of course, you remember they had the big shootout up there and it even made, Lee Marvin had a television show, and I think it was in 63, and it featured, uh, the Battle of Chicken Hill. 
but that's why Chicken Hill is Chicken Hill. <laughs> so now the P&LE Railroad, everybody was angry with the Pensy because of the rebates and uh, they were, you know, they controlled everything. So they wanted an independent railroad and so did the Harmony Society. At the time, the Harmony Society was developing the town of Beaver Falls, among other things. And they wanted another railroad besides the Fort Wayne to service the railroad, even though they were major stockholders in the Pittsburgh, Fort Wayne, and Chicago. And one of the reasons that they wanted another railroad, there were a lot of them, was to free the mines on the little sawmill run from dependence on the river. The river was frozen, it was too low, it was too high, stopped the production of the mines, and also by having a railroad it would open up more markets. So the PNLE was completed uh, February 10, 79. The little sawmill run bought uh, coal cars so they could use for interchange because those little cars we saw before were exclusively to be used to haul coal to the river. And they built a connecting track to the PNLE. And here we have now, this is a 1904 photograph. This bridge, the Hall Trust Bridge, was originally the connector to the PNLE. There would have been a trussle come off here. And this is one of the original little sawmill run cars that they built to use for interchange. 16, 18 ton cars. See the Lincoln pin coupler here. Of course, by now it's a West Side belt car. And there's a locomotive. And you've all seen this tunnel, the skewed arch tunnel under uh, the railroad tracks. It's still there today. Photograph taken in 1904, but still has the old equipment. And here's the little sawmill run coal dock. I tried to get uh, find a glass print for this from the state, but nobody in Harrisburg could find it, so I guess it's gone. This is after the PLE is built. Here's cars on the interchange track for the PLE to pick up. Here's your four wheel cars. They dropped them down by cable, and here you go. They're going to lower this to the barge and then open the drop doors. So you see, at five tons of, a pop, that's a, really an inefficient operation there. And there's Duquesne Heights or the uh, west end of Mount Washington, whatever you want to call it. Any questions? Okay, now, Colonel Espy, good old Colonel Espy, he wanted to extend the little sawmill run to Painter's Run, see? Now, you can imagine, he's going to go over hills and down, I mean, it's, you know the topography of the area. It's not going to be very conducive for a railroad. Now, Espy's plan was opposed by Jacob Henrici. He wanted to use a water level route that would eventually become the Pittsburgh Chartiers in Yawkegeny. <clears throat> also, <clears throat> the plan included the Chartiers Block Coal Company. Henry C. Hartley and Marshall and other investors formed the Chartiers Coal Block Coal Company and owned all that property along Tom's Run. Their plan was to own the coal and lease the mineral rights, let somebody else mine the coal and they would get the, uh, the dividends. They also own some coal up there along Painter's Run. So again, we have the connection between the uh, little sawmill run in this area. <clears throat> now here's uh, old Colonel Espy. He drew this map that you really can't see well. You really can't see the original very well. And he's telling es uh, Henrici, look, the little sawmill run, we come up here from our tipple. It's only three miles to get to Painter's Run. Of course, he's not saying how he's going to get there, over hills and so forth. And he says, now look, you're Jacob Henry. See, your railroad is going to be 12 miles long, and there's Bridgeville up there, and then go to Painter's Run, and then go up to Tom's Run. It'd be a lot easier only to go six miles. Now, of course, as an operating railroad man, you know that's not going to be practical. But here we go. Here's the PCMY that was really built and down to Neville Island we're not interested in, but we come up under the uh, Thornburg Bridge there, and then Junction 1 at Glendale, then they had trackage rights over the uh, Chartiers Valley branch of the Pensy, and then at Woodville, we take off and go up to, uh, up along Tom's Run there, and then of course right here we come across Universal Cyclops and we uh, go up the valley right here, to Beedling, where the Beedling brothers have relocated now. And you see the little, this is now the West Side Belt, but here's your railroad from the river to Banksville. So originally this railroad, instead of stopping at Banksville, would have come out here because they always knew somebody was going to build a railroad that became the Chartiers Valley. 
so they wanted to be ready to connect with them. But uh, in 74, Espy got uh, permission to come all the way over here. And again, if you know the topography of the area, how's he going to get here? You know, I, I mean, it's, it's interesting to get a uh, geological survey map and try to figure out how he was going to do it. <coughs> but here's a letterhead, uh, Pittsburgh Chartiers and Yawkegeny, saying that the little sawmill run owned a thousand shares of PCMY stock and they were titled, entitled to 94 more shares. And there's a copy to Henrici, who was a treasurer of the uh, Little Sawmill Run. And now here's a Little Sawmill Run letterhead saying that there was a, a note drawn on the Chartier's Block Coal Company in favor of Hartley Marshall. And so we always have this tie into this area. Now, oh, here's a special insert. The kids in Green Tree didn't get to see this, okay? <laughs> this is for Yince guys, <clears throat> okay? So get ready. Now, here we go. Here's a PCMY. They're coming across, coming across the creek. Here's Universal Cyclops over here. They're coming out. And here's, here's the mine tracks right along Bar Hill Road. Here's Calbro Tower. Then we come up here through the tunnel. So they had a spur that came off down there. The main line then went through the tunnel. And then where we go here, let's see, this is getting exciting. Oh, now we're on the other side, side of the creek. And there you see, that's Essen Mine there. And the little company houses up on top of the hill. And you know, you've got that coal act crop here. That's, here we got some more here. Oh, here we go. Now McMillan Road comes down here. So you can imagine you had McMillan Road today with a railroad crossing. That would be all you'd really need, huh? So here's your loaded tracks for the, the uh, Beedling Mine, which was by now owned by Pittsburgh Coal. Here's uh, your tipple and your empty tracks. Now that uh, tavern that's right there, that used to be the St. Clair Hotel. Henrici actually stayed there a couple times when he was over uh, inspecting the uh, PCMY because he was really a hands-on manager. So now these are the same maps, but I did it so you could see where the roads are. So here's Bar Hill Road, and again, this is, they've widened the road since this map was done. But here's Bar Hill Road, goes right through the coal tracks, under the coal tipple, and right along the mine tracks. And again, Calbro Tower is down in here. So it gives you an idea where the railroad really ran. And now here we come, here's your uh, intersection, which again was modified. Bar Hill Road, Painter's Run, here's your tunnel, and here's where the, uh, the highway's on this side of the creek and the, the mine's on the other side. And a little further up the valley, there's the mine again, and here's McMillan Road coming down here. And now we got uh, Beedling Mine and the road, and I, I just take it up to, uh, what you call it, where the intersection, uh, Cedar Boulevard. Can you still call it Cedar Boulevard? Mm -hmm. yeah. Where Cedar Boulevard come? here's Cedar Boulevard coming down here. And of course they had Cedar Lake up here and that's where Mount Lebanon has their, uh, their uh, maintenance uh, garage. I remember when it was built like 50 some years ago, they called it the Truck Taj Mahal. Everybody was upset they were spending all the money on the garages. But here's a, uh, a shaft here for the Beedling Mine and some old workings there. Question. Yes. Where do the tracks end? Oh, the tracks end up here. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, they don't go all the way up to Cedar Boulevard, or at least they did. They they cut them off by the time this mine this map was done in the twenties. So that's your special Bridgeville insert. Now the Pittsburgh Southern Railroad. I really don't get into this because I knew there were other people researching it. But it was a narrow gauge railroad. I don't know if, if you're rail fans, you know about this and the Great Castle Shannon Railroad War. The Pittsburgh and Castle Shannon, which became the streetcar line, was uh, the president was uh, Milton D. Hayes. Well, he wanted to extend the railroad to Little Washington, which he did, but he didn't involve any of the Pittsburgh Castle Shannon stockholders. But Milton D. Hayes, president of both railroads, the president of the Little Castle, or the 
Pittsburgh Castle Shannon leased equipment to the Pittsburgh and Southern, and the president of both lines was very happy, but the stockholders of the Pittsburgh Castle Shannon, not so much. So it was a 42-inch gauge railroad, I believe, or 40, it was an odd gauge. And uh, so they got rid of uh, Milton D. Hayes, and he stuck with his railroad to Little Washington. He had to change the gauge to three foot, because that was the only equipment he could have. Now he's stuck, ending up down there in Castle Shannon by where the ice castle is, see. So he contacts Jacob Henrici, the Harmony Society, and uh, gets permission to double track the little sawmill run, <clears throat> excuse me. And he built what is now the streetcar line up through Arlington. That was Pittsburgh Southern's connection. And they came out by Washington, uh, by Washington Cemetery next to the barn. They uh, made a cut in Washington Road, put a bridge in for Washington <coughs> Road. They ended up going up and they crossed McFarland Road above Dormont Park. And uh, they came down and connected with the little sawmill run. So, question. Yes. Where did they cross Washington Road? Uh, they came out beside the barn in Washington, in, the, in Mount Lebanon Cemetery. No, I'm sorry. Mount, it was Mount Lebanon Cemetery. And they made a cut in the road and they put a bridge in there. That would be pretty near Shady Drive, or what's the next one up? Okay, not the uh, I'm not really sure. I, I can't. Yeah, I'm not really sure exactly where that is. That might be Commons as a fountain that used to be the streetcar loop. Oh, no, no, no. It was up further in the streetcar loop. You refer to the barn because there's. The, I there's oh, yeah, there's a, the barn that's still standing in the cemetery. Okay. They came out near there. Okay. They went under Bower Hill as well, I believe, did they not? No, he didn't have to. No, because he came up Arlington, and where the streetcar used to come up, where it came up, well, it it it, it left uh, the road from Arlington and then came up came up by the cemetery, because you know they hold they had a cemetery train and stuff. So anyway, here's your little sawmill run. The planned little sawmill run would have come out here. If Espy had had his way, it would have come down here, and here's Bridgeville. So here's your Pittsburgh Southern Railroad. Okay, and now here's your Pittsburgh Castle Shannon when they had to fight and they really had a riot the whole bit. Uh, Milton Hayes built this extension and this is your streetcar tracks. And then they came down by Dormont Pool there, they crossed uh, McFarland. And here's what dual gauge trackage looks like if you're not familiar with it. <clears throat> so. Your standard gauge little sawmill run would have ran out on these outer two tracks. The three-foot gauge Pittsburgh Southern would have run on these two tracks. So that's what dual gauge trackage is. Now here's a letter from uh, Milton D. Hayes there to Jacob N. Reese, and Lentz was the other trustee on Pittsburgh Southern letterhead. He wanted to borrow some money that the Henry C., they lent a lot of money. They had a lot of investments, but they didn't lend uh, Hayes any money because they knew how shaky he was. So anyway, here's uh, Union Township, Green Tree. So the uh, Pittsburgh Southern would come down past Banksville Plaza there. And here's the, uh, the big mine at Banksville. That was the uh, Hartley Marshall. And again, that's where that photograph or the uh, drawing was taken. Here's another map. This is the Venture Mine went in under Green Tree and so forth and connected with the Chest Mine, which was down here. The Coal Ridge Mine went in under, uh, came out under Neal Avenue. And uh, this was the Eclipse Mine worked for several years. And again, this is Chapel Avenue today. This is Coast Avenue. But anyway, the Pittsburgh Southern would stop here and they had a Telegraph for one year, then they used a telephone. They telephoned down to the West End to see if it was okay to proceed. Then the little, then the uh, Pittsburgh Southern train would come down, and where the uh, here's Crane Avenue. Then they had a Y where the motel is. They'd leave their train out here on the main line.
because the engine was headed north. You always wanted your engine headed in the direction of travel, if you could, especially for any distance. They would turn the engine on the Y and then proceed down to the uh, west end. Now, here's the west end, and then you had the uh, dual gauge would end here. Your Pittsburgh Southern Depot was here. Then now they show the track going all the way down to the p and &E. I don't believe it ever did. There was no real reason to because that was a standard gauge. And you see the p and &E was built on pilings until they filled in the river. So that's why the tracks shows out in the river. And then your little sawmill run came across your coal dock and then your track that was a connection with the p and &E. Well, they operated for about uh, six, seven years. And SP ended up running the uh, Pittsburgh Southern. He wanted to add it to the little sawmill run. Henrici, they bought some stock in the Pittsburgh Southern. They wanted to add it to the PCMY. And originally the PCMY was going to go out McLaughlin's Run Road to Drake Road, uh, run along where uh, Patterson Road is in Bethel Park, and hang a right along the streetcar, and then tail off in the library and head down toward the river. Everybody had big plans. But uh, here's a little sawmill run timetable. And now they were running regular service, and when you think it, these are leaving Banksville and they're coasting down, yet they did it on schedule. They switched the uh, cold locks, and then they had a schedule to bring the, uh, the coach back up with the empty mine cars. And here we have, in the city of Pittsburgh, you had Eastern Standard Time, Central Time, and even different railroads that were owned by the Pennsylvania system operated on different times. So again, that's why the railroads came up with that standard time zone. Here's Banksville, <clears throat> about 1890. Carnahan, or we used to call it School Hill, the old school. There's a Hartley Marshall mine. You can barely see the engine here. And you've got coal cars where the road is today. Now, where would present day Wenzel be? There? Wenzel's right here. Right there. And there's that mansion. You, can, you can't see it too well in this background. Well, there's still a road up on that hill. Yeah, there the is. Uh, now it's Toll Avenue. It used to be Coal Road or something. Now, I blew this up a little bit just so you could see. There's the engine. It's got a load of coal, uh, coal cars. There's some more coal cars in that building sitting in where the road is now. And there's a script. All the, of course, all the miners, all the mines paid in script. You didn't get cash, you had to shop at the company store. And the coal companies always said the thing that kept them in the black was the sales from the company store and the rent from the company houses. That's what made the difference. That's why they didn't want to pay the miners in cash so they could shop somewhere else. They had a captive uh, clientele. So what do we do if we have a company store? Well, the Banksville miners formed a co-op to compete with the company store. So apparently they were getting cash, so at least some cash they were getting. So they had their own co-op. And again, this is where Banksville Road is today. And it turned out it worked against the miners in the long run, but it was very profitable. And here's Banksville Harbor, not Banksville, this is West End Harbor from Duquesne Heights. You double track P, uh, Pennsylvania Railroad when they had the bridge before they put the fill in. The P&LE double track, your little sawmill run coal docks, and I really wish that boat wasn't there. But And then some barges are getting ready to drop down to uh, load coal in. Very busy Pittsburgh Harbor. And here's a uh, typical boat. This is the Tom Doddridge, nicknamed the Long Tom. And anytime you see a picture of a steamboat <clears throat> with the RC on the pilot house, that stands for River Combine. It was owned by the uh, Monongahela Consolidated, Consolidation Coal and Coke. 1899-1900, uh, Pittsburgh Coal was formed to control the <laughs> most of the railroad serve mines, and uh, Monongahela Consolidation Coal and Coke got the river mines, the river mines being controlled by Rockefeller, the railroad mines being controlled by Mellon. So here's the Venture Mine. Now, the photographer is standing on the hill behind Mount Lebanon Office Supply. And if you look at that hill when the leaves are gone, you can see a little indentation. 
and this was Banksville Avenue, so this was the, the present day Banksville Road. And if you're on Banksville Road, and if you look over here, you can still, cha uh, chapels down here, you can still see where the old road used to run. And here's a uh, bill for coal, 1899. So the mine, the mine actually was bought by Pittsburgh Coal. They closed it at the uh, end of 1899. So that mine that we just saw the picture of had about one month to work when this coal was sold, sold to uh, Everhart and Ober, or E and O Beer. Now, I couldn't get a good photograph of this. The fellow that had the real photograph was at the uh, Snowden Historical Society back when everybody had a Xerox machine and nobody could copy photos. So, as I was told, a bad photo is better than no photo. <laughs> so this house is still standing. A couple of these houses are still standing, but this house is really noticeable. And then there's a chimney for the, uh, the steam plant, and here's your cars coming out of the mine. And your these are railroad cars going to the P&LE because they're the standard railroad car. Question. Yes. Wenzel. Where's Wenzel? Wenzel's right here. And this is where the, uh, this is the parking lot of Staples. Because okay. you used to be able to see the portal before they put the drugstore and Staples in. Now I redid this a little bit, trying to get a little bit more detail out. And you can, again, you can see the Haas. But these are the small railroad cars that are going to go to the River Tipple. And you can see them underneath uh, the mine tipple here. But I mean, that's the oddest looking mine I ever saw. I've seen a lot of mine pictures. I never saw a mine look like that. <laughs> so here's a, uh, a bill, 1890 for coal. And by now, uh, Marshall or, has retired and you have Hartley and Henderson. And uh, they sold coal to E&O Beer also, and that was made in 1890. Now this Henderson fella, I really hoped this was Henderson from Hendersonville, but it wasn't. This Henderson lived up in Beachview, and apparently he wasn't a very nice person. Mr. Rogers wouldn't have wanted him in his neighborhood, because <clears throat> he ended up marrying a 19-year-old or an 18-year-old daughter of another coal merchant, and when he left on his honeymoon, he cleaned out the bank account of Hartley and what had been Hartley and Marshall. So, you know, he wasn't a very nice, he was not the fellow from Hendersonville like I hoped he would have been. Now here's a secondhand P&LE locomotive that the little sawmill run west side belt was using. This is the bridge over the uh, sawmill run in Main Street. This is a Howe Trust bridge. And the photographer's standing on Steuben Street, and this is, they had a siding, and this is where the switch, the switch points actually were almost in Steuben Street. And again, the engine's headed toward Banksville. And here's the uh, last new locomotive that the uh, little sawmill run purchased, 1884, from the Pittsburgh Locomotive Works over on the north side. That was the building that the Port Authority used for a bus garage. They just tore it down. That's where they were located. Carnegie started the building. And uh, you can see it was a glass print and it's cracked. Now this next photo I'm going to show you is a newspaper photo of this locomotive. This was taken in 1884. This next photo taken in 1901 appeared in the Pittsburgh newspaper. And again, a bad photo is better than no photo. And, uh, there they are oiling around. And this is after the uh, West Side Belt took over. And here's the uh, passenger coach again from 1901. Still had the Lincoln Pin coupler, what we can barely make out. Now, <clears throat> Dormont Historical Society had this photo, and naturally it's a photo of the school. And the old school was located where the playground is for the school today. However, I'm not interested in that. I'm interested in these railroad cars down here, right there where Banksville Road is today, and we see some small cars that are going to go to the coal tipples on the river, and some larger cars that are going to be given to the P&LE at the interchange. So now the West Side Belt, what happened? We had some investors uh, 
Calry of Calry PA and uh, Scully and uh, your typical Pittsburgh invest investors. They owned a lot of uh, horse-drawn streetcars. They invested in coal and railroads, so they buy this. They had big plants for this railroad. They called it the West Side Belt. And by now, in 1903, they're not uh, more conventional. They're using a locomotive, and they only have one train to Pittsburgh, the West End, and one train back. But they've got the line they're building through Castle Shannon and out along 88 down to Clareton. They had an interchange in 1904. They built an interchange, the West Side Belt, in the West End with the Pennsylvania Railroad. And they were also going to interchange with the Pennsylvania Railroad at Clareton. They interchanged, well, they interchanged passengers at Pittsburgh and Castle Shannon and with the B&O in Bruce or Brewston. So now your West Side Belt here, oh, I'm going the wrong way. How about that? Okay, so now here, down in the West End, the photographer's standing on the, uh, the fill right over to Steuben Street. And we're looking down, here's Main Street down here. This is Greenleaf. And here's an old trussel where in 1904, the now West Side Belt, which used to be the little sawmill run, had a connecting line to connect with the Pensy. Now, of course, when George J. Gould bought the West Side Belt, that was the end of that connection because Gould and the Pensy were always feuding, and he didn't want any, anything more to do with them than he had to. So in 1904, the West uh, Pittsburgh Terminal Railroad purchased the West Side Belt Railroad, and the West Side Belt was part of the uh, Pittsburgh Terminal Railroad and Coal Corporation. So the West Side Belt was the railroad end of it, and they built seven mines. And of course, uh, one and two were at Castle Shannon. Mine three is at Molinaire out there at Washington Junction along 88. Mine four was at Horning. Mine five at, Bruce, at uh, Bronzeville Road. Mine six at Brewston. Mine seven right uh, by where 51 used to cross or at large there. Of course, now you've got the toll road. And now what the uh, Gould wanted to do, he wanted to run the railroad, let Pittsburgh Coal, since they helped finance the Wabash, run the mines. So they leased the mines on the west side belt to Pittsburgh Coal. Unfortunately, they forgot to buy coal cars. So they, couldn't, they didn't have enough coal cars to ship the coal, so Pittsburgh Coal canceled the lease. But a lot of times, if you guys are in the railroad history and coal history, you'll see the mines listed as A, B, C, and so forth instead of the numerics. <clears throat> Oftentimes also, Mine 8 at Coverdale is called Mine H, but it never was Mine H because it wasn't open until 2021. So here's, the, uh, here's your original little sawmill run coming up here, now the West Side Belt, and that's the Banksville Branch, they called it. And here's Mine 2 and 3 at Castle Shannon. There's Mine 8 that will be built in Bethel off the Montour and your other terminal mines. Okay, now we all rode on the streetcar, so here's that uh, Palm Garden in the South, Belt, uh, yeah, South Hills Junction. This is the west end of West Liberty Yard here. Now, the Wabash Pittsburgh Terminal Railway, Gould had big plans, as you probably all know from living in Bridgeville. He's going to build a joint yard in the West End with the Pittsburgh and Lake Erie. He's going to build a branch off the Wabash Bridge down along Carson Street to get to J&L. That didn't work out too well. He's going to extend the Banksville branch to reach the coal lands he owned in Washington County. He was going to build a bridge across the Allegheny River to reach the Buffalo, Rochester, and Pittsburgh. But when the Pennsylvania Railroad built the elevated tracks along Duquesne Way to get to the warehouse that effectively blocked him off. That's one of the reasons why they did that. But he had property left over from uh, trying to build that railroad on the south side, and they did build uh, the yard in the west end. Now, about 1905-1906, they take the, the big mine in Banksville, the last mine working, closed in 1904. They were going to reopen the mine. Pittsburgh Coal wanted to build a new mine in 1902 
a modern facility, but they didn't have any, they didn't have a need for company houses because most of the miners lived in their own homes. They didn't need a company store because the miners had a co-op and that's what made the difference in the coal company. So to heck with Banksville, we'll just take the coal out of Mansfield mine and we'll take it out of South Hills mine in a couple years. So being a railroader, I am very interested in track configurations. And this is what the trackage looked like after the, uh, the tipples were gone, they still had the connection with the, uh, the P&LE. But here's the next photo you're going to see is a photo of the railroad the way, with this track configuration, which I really like. <clears throat> and now it's a flood, 1907. Here's your bridges, and of course they no longer go to the river. The P&LE has been ex expanded to four, four tracks, as you can see on the signals. And we have some cars sitting here and the engine moving through the floodwaters. And it, they always put cars, loaded coal cars, on the riverside track to keep the debris and the ice and so forth off the railroad to protect the train so they could still run some traffic. Now, they thought they still wanted to get coal from the west side belt down to the river, so this is one of the plans they had. They're going to have the west side belt with a trussle here and a west side belt track. And they were going to cr or cross over. And here's a west side belt track on the river side. Here's another plan they dreamed up. Then they were going to have an Archimedes screw come under the, the P&LE and load barges. That never worked out, but seemed like a good idea at the time. Now here's a, a secondhand locomotive the west side belt was operating. I included this because oftentimes you see three-quarter shots of locomotives from the front. You very sel seldom see a, a shot like this. And this is down the West End Yard. There's the Ohio Connecting Bridge in the background. And now here's your West End Yard. And the fellow standing up on the fill, here's the uh, where Steuben Street would go under. And that's where all the uh, trackage was to get to the coal dock, was up on this uh, shelf. Now this bridge was replaced when they put the Fort, or the West End Bridge in. So that bridge was replaced. We're looking west, and this again is the Tom Doddridge sitting down there. So the Wabash or <coughs> built some of the tracks, and the P&LE built some of the tracks. Now the photographer is going to turn around and look toward Pittsburgh, which we cannot see because it's the smoky city at the time. Uh, here's the uh, ferry, uh, the West End Bridge is right in here. So they had the ferry go across. This is your, uh, the bar of the sawmill run. There's a p and engine pulling through the yard. That's Riverside High School, Carson Street, Main Street comes out here. Now, what they had, some of the property left over, and here is the Port Authority Bridge the old Panhandle Bridge. So Gould wanted to service Pittsburgh. So he had his freight house with the Wabash building, but he also wanted to service the south side. So what he would do, he would leave cars, the, Wal or the, West, the Wabash would bring cars to West Belt Junction or the, or, the, or the Rook, whichever one. And then the West Side Belt would bring cars down here to the West End the p &E would pick up the cars from here and take them down to the Wabash Yard next to the Panhandle Bridge or now the Port Authority Bridge. So here's Station Square, the p &E building, here's the Smithfield Street Bridge. The p &E had freight facilities here. The Wabash owned this property right here, but the p &E crews put the cars in. The Wabash paid the P&LE $5 to haul a car from the West End down to here and spot the thing and then bring it back empty. So it really uh, wasn't a money-making operation, but they wanted to have their name, the Wabash name down here. They ended up selling this yard in about 26. And of course today, this is all a parking lot in here. Now, <clears throat> when they redid the Banksville branch, remember that one photo I showed you? where they had the trussle against the hillside. Well, when they rebuilt the Banksville branch in 07 to get to Gould's Coal in Washington County, 
they did away with this trussle, they used the fill, and then they put a retaining wall in, and today this is all under the parkway. Now, down in the West End, and remember, of course, we're in Pittsburgh where the streets turn in to steps and then they turn into bridges or it's roads again. This is Alexander Street footbridge. So Alexander Street's down here. You come up, walk across the bridge, and then you climb all the way up, and then you come out on Alexander Street up here. And uh, this is where Shields paint would eventually be in the West End. And here's what it looks like today. Main tracks gone, siding, and even Shields paint's closed, and that's where the uh, bridge would be. Now, here's in 1912, <clears throat> the photographer standing on Shaler Street. There were three Lucky schools in, Pen in Pittsburgh. Lucky was the name of the superintendent, and he, uh, he must have been pretty good to name three schools after him. But anyway, here's Chicken Hill up here. Here's your PWV bridge. Bingham Cut used to be a tunnel, but it kept caving in. This is Bingham Hill, owned at, by named for a family that lived there. Now it's Shady Crest is up here. Here's Banksville Junction where the roads, the railroad goes up the valley. Here's your new way to go to Clareton on the west side belt. And this, of course, is Shalerville. And of course, this is all full of highway now. And what would that look like today? Approximately like this with one of your oil trains, and I'm standing on the bridge over the, uh, the West End Bypass. Now we're coming down Banksville Avenue, and it was paved by this time. Here's cars stored on the Banksville branch. This was 1922. <coughs> they had a coal strike, and uh, about a week before this photo was taken by the city of Pittsburgh photographer, I have a letter that said, there was a derailment on the Banksville branch, the rail spread, so apparently when they were putting these cars in, they derailed the engine. I use this photo because there's a train on the bridge, even though you really can't see it. <coughs> Those photographs were great for capturing, capturing images, but they didn't stop motion. So now we go down the road a little bit around the curve, and we see the fellows working on the sewer, again the cars, and we go down a little further, a little bit later on, there's Banksville Circle, some automobiles parked here. But what are you gonna see if you're down there today? This is what you're gonna see, right? Now the bridge, again, was redone in 34 to handle the heavier equipment when they built the Connellsville extension and they bought the Malleys for the p and heavier engines. But that's what you'll see today, but that's why that bridge looks different than it did in the older photos. Now here's Banksville taken from Carnahan. Okay, the mine's long gone. They have one track left in. This is Beachview Supply, and there was Lindsley, uh, Ashley, Lashley Lumber. So a lot of the houses in Dormont, Mount Lebanon, Green Tree, Beachview, they received the building supplies in here. They received cement. Uh, Union Township <clears throat> received cinders and gravel and so forth and supplies and again here's the same house again right up in here there's uh wenzel up here and there's the uh, catholic church there okay and i uh i just this is not a photo from the Dormont historical society and again this was cole street now it's coal avenue or this was cold no this was temple road this was coal, and now it's uh, connected and it's uh, coal avenue, I think they call it. That light turn is still there. It's still there? It's still there. You can drive up above Staples and you make that tight turn. Okay. And here's your SB estate, so it takes this photograph. Well, we know uh, from when the railroad was, but it takes it to before, say, 26. Here's a. Uh, a barn that was used when they brought the mine mules out. And this was a slate dump. So they bring this, the coal out of the dip hole and then they bring the slate back and dump it. So when they built, when they built Mansfield Road, they used the water that for fill. So here is, uh, they wanted to rebuild the railroad to Banksville, but they decided, this was in 26, they decided it cost $50,000 because they wanted some industrial sites, but uh, it never panned out. 
And here's another view of Banksville. Here's that uh, chimney that we saw in that other photograph where the temple was. Here's the engine house that was born down in 34. Banksville School, again, where the playground is today. And there's that stone house that's still standing. Now, the Pittsburgh and West Virginia. Uh, the Pittsburgh and West Virginia operated the West Side Belt, but it was kept as a separate uh, corporation. Now they merged officially in 29. And now, <clears throat> this photo, this, this is, uh, we're standing almost on the bridge across uh, the creek there at uh, the foot of Carnahan. This house has just been remodeled. Here's an entrance to uh, the en another entrance, probably a mule hole for the venture mine. Deadly handled and burial vault, if you remember that. Now it's Mount Lebanon office supply. But we want to notice this bridge. This was a railroad bridge. It was originally a double track railroad bridge across the creek. However, at this time the rails were gone, but the, the one span, they removed the one span, and they took that one span, and they used it in a highway bridge that we've probably all been over. It's been since replaced, but the crooked rail, the crooked bridge at Woodville over the B&W tracks, that's where they took that span from the railroad in Banksville and used it in that highway bridge the crooked bridge that used to be up there at Woodville. So we've all been over a railroad bridge that used to be at Banksville at one time. At least most of us have. <clears throat> now the photographer, if you're familiar with Banksville, is standing at Beto's Pizza. And he's looking toward Mount Lebanon. This house is just torn down. 1,500 banks. Actually, it was built by my great-grandfather as a tavern. And this was a Union Valley Social Club. And apparently at one time, uh, the good folks from Banksville came down here and said, everybody at my grand great-grandfather's tavern is too rotty. And uh, one of my great uncles said, no, it wasn't us. It was over at Union Valley Social Club. <laughs> but anyway, uh, <clears throat> here's a truck. And you can see pretty much he's going uh, toward Mount Lebanon on the right-hand lane. And then your passing lane would be here, your medium, and then these are your inbound tracks on Banks Hill Road today. So they knocked this down. This was higher, of course, than the, uh, the road. Now, the photographer turns around and he's uh, looking in here as Goldstrom Avenue here. And we had a big war shot, so we couldn't use the tracks. And the road, the old road, comes out about here. Uh, the FOP is here, Arlington Auto Body, and where the billboards were is where Arby's is today. So again, uh, the old road's still there, but it comes out on the main road, the new road. I call it the new road. That's all the four lanes today. Now further down the road, we see uh, Crane Avenue and the railroad curves around, and uh, after a prohibition put all my uh, grandfather's, not my great-grandfather, put my grandfather's competition out of business, he built a new beer garden and had beer written on the roof, much to the chagrin of my grandmother. But he had a mind to put, during the Depression, he had to put his brother-in-laws to work, because if you don't put your brother-in-laws to work, they're going to move in with you, right? So the coal in Banksville, down at, at Banks, at, at the west, at the, uh, at the high and low bridge down there, the coal's up here, and it dips down. The coal seam dips till it reaches uh, the valley floor there where Staples is, and the, the valley floor rises. So the coal's still up high, so he dropped the coal down. There's a coal car there from the, a mine car. Dumped it in the temple and then <coughs> trucked it to Mount Lebanon. But here again, uh, that's where Eaton Park is down here now. And further down the road, we have what was the longest bridge on the Banksville branch. It was about 187 feet long. And of course, this bridge was rebuilt in 07, so it would have been a steel girder bridge on wooden bends. But just where is that bridge today? Right there, Metropolitan Heating. And that's where the old road came out. The old road was right across on the other side from where that bridge is. And of course, this is one of the one spot 
where the creek is, has not been covered down along the hillside there. And of course, there's Shady Crest up there. So, when we're going to build the new four lane in 1937, and the railroad sold a lot of property, and here's those houses up here, and here's that road with the curb and everything. So, beef few supply that we saw in that one picture was right here. We saw the corner of the building. Lashley Lumber was here at Bidmont. The engine house is right here, and the engine house was right, the doors to the engine house opened up almost on Wenzel Avenue. So that's where the new road comes in relationship with this where the tracks used to be up in Banksville. Now here's, uh, this is interesting, if you want to get into an argument you want to win it, you can tell somebody, you know, the Fort Pitt Bridge and the Fort Pitt Tunnel weren't always called that. They were going to be the Fort Duquesne Bridge and the Fort Duquesne Tunnel, and here's the letter to prove it. Okay? Subject, Fort Duquesne Bridge and Tunnel, Banksville Avenue Boulevard. So, at some point, they changed the name of the Fort Duquesne Bridge to the Fort Pitt Bridge and the Fort Duquesne Tunnel to the Fort Pitt Tunnel, and they... So, if you want to get into an argument with somebody at Lynn, I'll come over and show them this letter. <coughs> Now, here's some folks uh, when they're getting ready to build Banksville Road. They're inside the Enterprise Mine. And what the miners did from Banksville, there was a labor shortage when they opened up Mines 1 and 2 of Castle Shannon, and the miners from Banksville were out of work. They walked through the Banksville Mine, through the Hartley Marshall Mines tunnels to go to work in uh, Castle Shannon instead of walking up over the hill. Then the Venture Mine, they closed it. Pittsburgh Coal closed it, and they combined it with Idlewild Mine on the Pensy up there by Kraft and over the hill from uh, the seminary in, uh, what's it, Canada High School. Okay, now here's a shot, 19th, right after the West End Bridge taken, and the, the, everything was nice weather and everything. This photograph is in Shields paint, and you can see the West Side Belt PWV going across the tunnel. And of course, you can compare it with what it is today. We've got the extra hole in the wall here in the bridge. That building now has two stories. That's about the only thing that's left down here. That became Pennsylvania truck lines. Pennsylvania Railroad had all their uh, trucks and automobiles under the Pennsylvania truck lines umbrella. Here's another shot of the industries in the West End. Here's West End Playground. In the little sawmill run times, there was a salt work works there. Here's West End Coal, Shields Paint, and there's that foot crossing. And this track here with the gondolas goes down to uh, what would have been Deebold Lumber, down by where Plank Street comes across in the West End. And uh, just because I'm interested in this type of thing, here's West End Coal. They had a hopper there, they unloaded. Here's Shields Paint, they had a boxcar and some unneeded gondola to shove down the branch, or down the spur around. And again, here we're building the West End uh, bypass. So you can see the two stories in that building still here, and of course we come down this way today. Now, Frank Heckler, if anybody knows Frank Heckler from the Green Tree Historical Society, who has since gone to uh, greener pastures, took these photographs. Now, here's Shalerville. They're building the parkway. Here's the uh, pillars for the, or the piers for the bridge that's in there today, the low bridge. That's the uh, pillars because they raised the valley floor, as you can see. This is kind of interesting. And again, if you look closely, you can see the difference in the bridge. This part of the bridge is okay. Cars are sitting in traffic. There's where the railroad went to Banksville. <clears throat> now, okay, you see, this is how much they raised the valley floor. There's an Oriole bus coming on the temporary roadway, and you can see how small it is. There's the uh, pillar or the post or piers for the new bridge. And today, only about Four feet of this cement is visible. So you used to have the three X's go up. All this is underground. You don't realize how much they filled in that valley. 
so you can see the original bridge would only been a, a couple feet off the off the valley floor after they raised it. And here's the last rails to Bridgeville from Bridgeville Bankstone. And there was a uh, South Hills coal and ice was in there, and that is the frog for one of the switches that went to their siding. So that's the last rails to what was banks that we had removed. And that's the end, and there's a train that banked at West Belt Junction going toward Rook. And there's a BJ Power that controlled the tracks going to the Fall Bash Station. There's the line that went down to the West End. So that's it. So you can see the Harmony Society and the Little Sawmill run the same people had a lot of influence in this area. Yes. How come the Mount Washington? They used to have the coal wing climbs down through their river. Yeah, they had. Were they tied into the system? No, but those were the ones that uh, that Kirk Lewis would have built. They had, I think, oh, there was like over 20 of them at one time. Quite a few. Yeah, there was even more than 20, but I don't want to give them a figure. But yeah. Now, I always had a question. Uh, you don't see it here. I didn't have the photo. But as you're going west on Carson Street from the West End Circle, if you look, it looks like there's a tunnel on the hillside in the stone wall. Okay, that's not a tunnel. That was the foundation for Elliott Tower on the Pennsylvania Railroad. But a lot of people think that was a tunnel because it looks like it was a tunnel, but that was a fine day. So the next time you go down Carson Street, you'll know what that happened to be. So, one other thing. Now, Fox, he was a big deal in Green Tree, but Shammer Street is here. He had a uh, quarry on this side of Mount Washington, Duquesne Heights, and that's where his temple was. But if you go up Shammer Street, and you look to the left, there's a chain link fence with a gate, and it would have taken you back into where this was. Now that was a big deal in Green Tree, not so much here. So, so that's that. So any other questions? <laughs>